um, entrepreneurs in a variety of different industries, including authors and illustrators. Our focus really is to partner to help create business solutions that contribute to sustainable business, legal solutions that contribute to sustainable business practices and educating our clients and providing these kind of workshops is part of what we've done since the very beginning. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. I'm also here sharing some experience that I've learned in this first year of owning GWL Publishing, which uh, was founded to provide business support and publishing services for thought leaders and creatives. I do have to remind everyone that the information shared here today is intended to be educational and is not legal advice, but I do encourage you uh, to, um, to, of course, do your research and, and, and understand how some of these discussions that we're going to host today might apply to you and the work that you're doing. For part one, which was pre-recorded, we really covered the business of being an author. So separating this passion for writing as a hobby into something that is a business venture. We talked about the importance of establishing a business entity and really the most common sorts of entities that a business owner um, in this space may choose. And we did a deep dive on navigating intellectual property, both copyright and trademark. For this part two, we'll really pick up from, okay, your manuscript is now at a completed draft. And what does that mean in order to get it to the public and the masses? Some different contract law considerations to be aware of and the importance of estate planning for all business owners, including authors and illustrators. Although I'm gonna move through the presentation quickly and leave space for questions at the end, these workshops are designed to be interactive. And so if you have any questions, I do encourage you to please use the chat. Um, I encourage those that are here now to introduce yourself in the chat so we can understand who you are and really what experience you're bringing to the conversation. And we'll get that incorporated as well. Okay, so from manuscript to publish, the first thing that we can say is congratulations. So, and now the fun part begins. If you've ever written a book or had a book idea go from like idea to actual draft, you know that now is the fun part. Uh, so there might be time that you wanna reserve for both rewriting, editing, the design and the formatting portions of your book process. Uh, a really common question that we get from our business owner clients are is relating to an ISBN or an international standard book number. So an ISBN is a unique numeric identifier that is attached to each book and it is designed to help with discovering your book, tracking sales, and really being able to actively participate in these book distribution ecosystems. The purpose is to establish and identify one title or edition from one specific publisher and so I say that and try to articulate that because you'll need one ISBN per format. So if you decide to do a hardcover, a paperback, an audiobook, and an ebook, those are four different ISBNs. Um, there are 160 agencies across the world that help provide these numbers. And the United States is really kind of covered by one private company called Boker. Um, and their website, I'll drop it in the actual PDF for your review in the future, but um, if you spend some time on their website, it is quite clear. They also make clear who is um, eligible for an ISBN and who is not. And I do like to remind people that you don't need an ISBN to publish your book, but printed books can't be sold without them. So the cost varies for these numbers, um, and they can be sold in packages as well. But really, I think the most inexpensive one is, I think I saw one, about 125 and can include the barcodes as well. So packages are available for that ISBN. As you're considering obtaining this ISBN to serve, it, it would mark you as the sole owner and publisher of record, which I think is important. And some key questions to consider are, how many book titles are you planning to publish? How many formats will each title be created in? And how do you plan to publish future revised editions of any of your titles? Because any changes to format, binding, substantial content, et cetera, would require a new ISBN. So if you're only going to do one, e one book and it's 
ebook only. Um, and we're thinking about like the business of being an author, there are some cost considerations here and some alternatives. So if you use Amazon KPD, they do assign uh, an ISBN for you and that might work. Uh, you wouldn't be listed as the publisher of record. And so when we're talking about the business of building um, this kind of work as an author or illustrator, those are things to be mindful of. Um, from our example in part one, uh, Dr. Ryan was our case study author that we learned from, and she had a passion for genealogical history. And so if she was planning to just do a book on genealogical history for family and friends, and she didn't plan to sell it online or in stores, then maybe she wouldn't need to make the investment for that book and an ISBN. But um, I would encourage, you know, if you are planning to really build your, your business and your career as an author, that you are the publisher and owner of record for, for all of your titles. Um, and then of course, from manuscript to publish, the big part of the work after that is really just spreading the word, that ongoing engagement, getting people to um, see the versions of your book. And there's not a lot of legal considerations there on that note, but I include it because a reminder that having the first draft done is not the um, completion of the process. It is, is really kind of the beginning of the fun part. Okay, so let's just high level have a conversation here about the differences between publishing with a publishing company and using some sort of kind of self-publishing platforms or doing this on your own. When you work with a publishing company, these are some of the benefits that you listed here on the left that you will receive in that relationship or that you should. So support through the editorial and design process like we're talking about, that marketing promotion and distribution support. Um, we'll talk about uh, rights in just one second. Um, but then there's also considerations. If you're working with a publishing company, they may have some delivery requirements. So when your uh, materials are due to them, amount of revisions and actually having it be accepted by them. Um, lots of considerations around royalties and advances, of course. Working with a publishing company may give you options for future works as well, as well as prints and, addition, and different editions. Now, when you're working with a publishing company, every book publishing agreement is going to have a grant of rights clause. We'll talk a little bit about contracts in a minute, but I just wanted to make the distinction between these kind of primary rights and the subsidiary rights when you're working with a publishing company. So the primary rights entail the right to publish the book normally, so in print and electronic format. And that's really kind of assumed. When you work with a publishing company, you do, it's assumed that you would grant that right. The other right to consider as an author is how subsidiary rights are handled. So subsidiary rights are the rights to make adaptations, to translate the book into different languages, um, to give others permission to publish little excerpts of your book, to make films, et cetera. So if you're, if you're giving to a publishing company a grant of primary and subsidiary rights, it really is important as a business owner to understand how those are going to be what we would call exploited. So making sure that if you make that grant and exclusive license, that you are uh, really able to reap the benefits. Otherwise, it may there may be opportunities to grant primary rights and reserve some of those subsidiary rights for yourself. If you are using a self-publishing platform and you decide you don't wanna work directly under a publishing company, some of the things to remember are that external assistance might be limited in terms of having one agency that can help you with your editing, your notes, your formatting, and your feedback. Um, but there are some ways to work around that, which we'll talk about in a bit with your beta readers. Uh, when you're using a self-publishing platform, you often maintain full control of those rights. So it's a non-exclusive license and grant of rights. So you hold uh, the, the primary rights and the subsidiary rights. Um, of course, if you're doing it on your own timing, it may require more time, but you don't generally have those external schedules or deadlines for delivery and actual acceptance. You have the op option to directly receive your royalties and the pay from sales, 
when you're self-publishing, you also own your ISBN. Uh, the asterisk there is around, again, if you're using Amazon KPD, um, KDP, you have kind of a, it's a 90 day exclusive grant of, of right to, to the program. Um, so you don't own your, for the ebook, excuse me. Um, and then promotion and distribution may be limited if you're doing your self-publishing, because again, it's, it's you. Um, and so that generally is results in fewer sales initially. But I think, you know, per the conversation that we hosted in part one, when you start this process and you're thinking about the business of being an author, it, of course, you're wanting to get your book from manuscript to published, but then really being able to understand and think through how you want to really develop your sales process and your marketing process is something that's really important to consider. Whether you're self-publishing or working with a publishing company, I think all these things should be weighed. And if you're going to work with a publishing company, really understanding, or a self-publishing platform even, understanding where they help and which parts that they won't help with so that you're able to really uh, spread the word about your book. One of the things that you'll notice in this conversation is that once the manuscript is completed, there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of people that you may work with in order to get your book into the masses, into the hands of the masses. So uh, our clients might be collaborating with other authors, um, especially books that are kind of compilation works. Um, there may be ghost writers or other contributors. Uh, uh, excuse me, illustrators and cover designers, um, photographers who might be helping you, editors, publishing companies, literary agents, narrators, beta readers, marketing professionals, and attorneys. So when you're working, developing the business of being an author, one thing I think that's really important is to understand who will you need in order to actually develop your book and really be able to develop the business of being an author? And what is the nature of, you know, your relationships with those and make with those folks and making sure that those relationships are in writing as well. From the list of kind of parties that we looked at here on this slide, in each of those relationships, there should be an agreement that captures how you want to work with them and the benefits of doing so. So you may see professional engagement agreements, publishing agreements, sale agreements, licensing agreements, merchandising and distribution contracts, and even kind of ongoing participation agreements. Uh, it would take us a two hour workshop to kind of look provision by provision at some of the the variables that we see in these contracts in terms of what rights are granted, but some of the important provisions that I always encourage our clients to think about are, you know, how is copyright managed in these agreements? And if you have collaborated with others in order to develop your book, because we know from part one that a finished book may have multiple copyrightable elements and multiple copyright owners, that as you work with others, you're mindful of that and the transfer of, the, of any of these copyright ownerships, that you're intentional about the grant and the reservation of rights, you know, we talked about primary and subsidiary rights. And you know, when we're working with first time authors or illustrators, often they wanna sign that first agreement that they get. So from our case study example, Dr. Ryan might have just signed that agreement that Arthur shared with her because she was glad that an agent had reached out to her. However, everything is negotiable. Um, and so we always encourage our clients to, you know, have an attorney review your agreements before you sign any of them and allowing yourself to the time that it's going to take to uh, edit and really negotiate to make sure that it works out for the business of being an author for you long term. Uh, each of these contracts will have specific grants of uses and restrictions on use, and that is important. Um, so let's say if you work with a publishing company to or a self-publishing platform to do your ebook, but you're able as an author to still publish your hardcover, your soft cover, uh, and maybe even an audiobook, it's important to know that because you might leverage other relationships in order to do that well. Portfolio use is you may have granted these rights to others, but as an author, you may still want to say, hey, that's my work or that was my 
uh, illustration in that work. And so understanding if you can actually use, if you have a portfolio use clause, that's important. Of course, when we're talking about the business of being an author or an illustrator, we have to be mindful of the money. So understanding advances, payments, you know, payments in general, money up front, investments required of you as an author or an illustrator, um, and any kind of ongoing royalties, I think is, is very important. And then remedies. So the great thing about business law is we are spending a lot of time thinking about the options, the what ifs. And so we want to make it very easy for people to do business, but then also understand what are the remedies if is it isn't working anymore and we need to go our separate ways. So if you're working with a publishing company and it's a five-year agreement, well, if things are, you know, whether for cause or without at year three need to transition, it's really important that you understand in your agreements how to best navigate and make those uh, amendments. Uh, there's then the last slide or kind of discussion that I want to host, and then we'll open it up for questions. So this is a shorter presentation, this part two, um, but I do want to make sure that we have time to talk about how things are actually showing up in you all's business as well. But the last thing that I try to talk to our authors and illustrator clients about is the importance of estate planning. Uh, for any business, whether it's a creative business or you're, you know, making widgets, they're the best time to consider is to start with the end in mind. So when you're at the beginning of your business, really kind of growing your, your reputation as an author or an illustrator to think about, okay, when I don't want to do this anymore, what, how will that impact my literary assets? Um, so why should business owners make a plan, including authors and illustrators? Hopefully you're over 18. None of us are immortal. You own these literary assets. You have capacity today. Um, for the example that we used before, Dr. Ryan, she wanted to use this writing career to secure future income and manage risk as she retired from being a full-time teacher and coach. Um, so this, it, making a solid plan around your estate planning and even your succession really is important in that respect. And then you have stakeholders who, you know, whether they're your readers, whether they're your contractors, your illustrators, um, your editors, your ghostwriters, they want to understand kind of the long-term plan as well. And so I think as business owners, you know, the things I just remind you is for estate planning, if you don't make a plan, there might be some severe tax implications. Um, we often share, and it, well, in 2017, when we hosted this class before, I had the actual figures that J.K. Rowling had made in terms of how much money she had made from uh, the Harry Potter franchise. And, you know, we some people are just selling, you know, one book at a time. Others, this is a full-blown career that can look like something like Harry Potter. So managing and understanding how it impacts your tax implications is crucial. Um, there's risk, of course. So if, I think it's important to write your plan now and you can make amendments to your estate plan. So, uh, and then options. The earlier you plan, the more options that you have to explore to really be able to leverage some of these literary assets. And again, that also goes to the more control that you have and it helps to um, increase, I think, the value of your literary assets. So one of the ways that our author and illustrator clients may manage this is as we're developing their estate plan, they may articulate or identify in their plan an actual literary trustee who understands and knows what all their literary assets are and can really help plan to navigate um, and really capitalize on those even after your passing. Because right, copyrights are for the life of the author plus 70 years. After 35 years, those rights can be amended, those contracts can be amended. And so it's important that you do identify someone who can keep track of that. And you know, some folks after they pass, that's when they have their kind of notoriety or when their reputation might um, become more aware on the public level. And so just having somebody who can manage those assets as you um, grow your business and even after your transition, I think is 
incredibly important. And so, um, you know, in doing this work and navigating the business of being an author or illustrator, it's much more than just writing the book and taking it from business idea into kind of printed book. And so you're going to need people to help. So we talked about the parties that you might work with, but you'll want to make sure that you have partners on the business level who understand what you're trying to do and can complement your entrepreneurial and maybe even your writing style. Um, there is nothing wrong with developing an informal advisory committee or a board that can help you see some of these blind spots that we all have as business owners. Um, there's I always encourage, I like to make a nod to just continue to engage with community resources. I always like to shout out the library's legal GPS system um, that can help business owners and authors and illustrators kind of think about the legal priorities that they may have before they go and meet with a professional service provider. But as an author or illustrator, you will need professional service providers. Of course, I'm biased on the legal side, but it takes much more than an attorney to grow a strong business. And so I encourage you to work, you know, identify a banker, an accountant, an insurance agent, a financial advisor, et cetera, who can help you not only grow the, the intellectual property and the business work that you have now, um, but what you want to, to do long-term in your company. All right, I'm gonna pause there and actually let me go back to, sorry to scroll so quickly on screen. Um, I just wanna open it up for questions for part one and part two. And I didn't see any introductions in the chat, but I'd love to hear from the group about who may be a published author, where you are in the process, some of the questions that you had, and we'll see if we might be able to cover those if we haven't already. Frederick, I see you're back. I think you're you're muted. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, thank y'all for having me too. Uh, I regret I was late and won't be able to stay long because I have a doctor's appointment I was unaware of. Um, but yeah, I'm a self-published uh, author. And like I told you before, the book that I wrote deals with people who've been wrongly convicted in state prisons across the country. Um, and most of the, before I, before I even uh, put the book into form, I did a lot of the background research, not as, 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 as intensive as you pointed out, but I covered some of the, some of the basic stuff I needed to do to get it started. And, uh, when I come home, I more or less had everything. I had a plan, so and I've been trying to follow it without getting ahead of myself. Sure. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody for showing up, and I want you to know I appreciate uh, you presenting this information to me because it kind of like give me a better, more concrete idea of what I could have and should be uh, lining myself up to do now. For sure. There's also been a great question that was just dropped into the chat from Laura, publishing under a pen name. And we didn't cover pen names in depth, but great question. How does it affect your copyright? So when you apply for a copyright, you can use the author's name. And there's also space to include your pseudonym in that copyright filing. Um, I, you know, why people use pen names is a whole other conversation. What I would encourage our clients to do is to use the author's actual name and the pen name and the filing. Now in the book, you may put just the copyright under the pen name, which is fine, but the, you know, it it speaks to this larger kind of legal issue about in the independent author space, if we're not registering our copy, because you can use the copyright symbol without actually registering with the United States Copyright Office to put people on notice. Um, what's happening is a lot of books aren't registered formally uh, in the copyright register. So I would register your copyright under both names. And really what I think is most readers aren't gonna go and look up the actual filed copyright because that really would then expose the author's actual name. Um, but that 
I think is qu quite rare that someone would actually go um, and actually search that filing. Um, Laura, do you want to come off a of mute and share a little bit more? I, I hope that covered your question. I can't see her in the room. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, I, um, so what I actually publish, I self-publish, um, it's cards, it's, uh, like playing cards and tarot card decks with the associated guidebook with it. Um, and recently one that I, I am just now releasing, I've been made aware that, um, Taobao.com, which is the Asian branch of Alibaba.com, has been trying to get a hold of my deck to make bootleg copies. And so I'm, I'm kind of scrambling to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to um, protect my self-published work, but I know that the pen name adds an extra layer to it. It, yeah, it does. But I mean, I was I was looking at the actual copyright filing uh, prior to the presentation, and there's space for both. So, okay. if you please feel free to reach out to me to talk through that if you'd like to. But um, so what we know about copyrights is that a work is protected as soon as it's created. But in order to uh, go after others for infringing on your work, it does have to be filed. Um, okay. The challenge, of course, is um, it's a federal filing. And so international protection is a whole other um, can of worms okay. and not always as easy to protect. But I do think, you know, when we're talking about developing this as a long-term business, um, having those appropriate filings makes sense. But there are business considerations, right? Because there's cost to, file a copyright, but it's not, it's, I think, $45, um, the actual filing cost. I'll have to triple check that, but um, worth it if you can. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to see if there's, this is a little bit small, um, but these are things that copyright protects. So it's a tangible expression of an idea, the actual text. Again, there could be multiple copyrightable works in one work and multiple authors and one or copyright owners and one work as well. Um, so these are just, as you're thinking about, we mentioned this in the last recording, but you know, any business really is developing, whether it's acknowledged or not, intellectual property. And if you really want to fully protect your intellectual property, it will often, you know, the final result looks like an intellectual property suite. You may have a copyright or multiple for all of these things included on the left um, in order to really make sure that your work is as protected as possible. I will just say the poor man's copyright is not legally sound or valid to kind of mail yourself a copy. There's, I don't, I don't know if that's ever worked, um, but there's way too many ways um, to kind of falsify that. And so um, book titles, character names, phrases, et cetera, these things are not copyrightable, but may be trademarkable. So when we're talking about an intellectual property suite, it would be often a combination of copyrights and trademarks and multiple of each. Perfect. Uh, I hate to put folks on the spot, but Brad, I know you were here early on. Are you an author and illustrator? Will you tell us a little bit about you? Mary, maybe too. Sure. Yes. Um, I'm an illustrator first and an author second. Um, picture books. Okay. So I've been doing this since 1989. No big deal. Just brand new at it. Yeah. So I've done it a while. Um, most of the time, most of my career, I was unagented but um, do have an agent now. And so my agent actually takes care of a lot of the things you've been talking about. But I felt like I should, I saw this and, and I just thought it's always good to be as prepared as possible so that I can carry on a, um, you know, speak, speak some of the vocabulary and, and, and uh, look out for myself and um, just having, 
intelligent conversation with my agent should things come up as far as what rights are granted, what publishers, what they're wanting as far as subsidiary rights, foreign language rights, um, ebook rights, audiobook rights. Um, so I'm just sort of an information gathering stage. Perfect. Well, but I think even your introduction has shared, you know, the business of being an author and illustrator. It might start as a passion or, you know, what you're kind of doing on the side. And over the years, you can grow into being represented and, you know, really be able to have some of these conversations. And so I love that. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. Happy to. All right. I uh, just wanted to maybe flip back over some of these. Uh, Brad, do you have any file copyrights or trademarks? Um, when uh, when a, a publisher agrees to publish one of my stories or I am illustrating someone else's story in the contract, the publisher will register my work they will cut with the copyright office under my name. And then if the book goes out of print, I send them a letter asking for a reversion of copyright so that <clears throat> that frees me up for in the future. If I want to seek publication elsewhere, I can do that. Nice. What do you think has been the most important lesson that you've learned, maybe legal lesson you've learned over your career? Well, knock on wood, I've not had any problems. Um, I think I've worked with good yeah. publishers, reputable publishers, and and there hasn't been anything that's come up. I know that at one point, and I think it goes on, it's something I'm always aware of. Um, once I publish a book and my work is out there, uh, there are nefarious entities that will try and often and have succeeded in um, publishing the illustrations without my permission. Um, I know that one company in China took several of my images from one of my picture books and published them, reprinted them as fine art prints, but there's really not much I can do from what I understand, given that they're a Chinese company and it's even it's really even hard to figure out who is doing it, frankly. Um, so I just have to say, oh, well, that's that's sort of the price of doing business, at least in that case, there's not much I can do. Um, and if I, I can always if if someone would try to reproduce it in book form, I, I would definitely reach out to the publisher and they have you know, more resources and expertise. And I think that's in their interest to not allow that to happen as well. So I think they would probably take a lead role in figuring out how to stop that. Yeah, so that is, would be directly discussed in contract as well. Um, and a good point to note, as we talked about in part one, intellectual property, after you get registered, the agencies, so the U.S. Copyright Office and the United States Patent and Trademark Office, they are not doing any policing for um, those intellectual property protections. So it is up to the owner um, to, to, to do that work, to see who's doing that, and to kind of be mindful and aware of that. There are systems there are companies you can hire to help you kind of monitor and track your IP. But um, one of the things, I'll just try to scroll back to the tips for protecting your IP slide, is to just regularly review that business supply chain to see, you know, if you know you're sending and for an illustrator copies of images to a small group, make sure you know how they're being used. In our case study example, um, Dr. Ryan sent a an advanced copy of a manuscript to a small group and a, a piece was leaked, a, a hard copy was given to someone else. And so just even managing those things up front, I think is, is important. Um, and again, it is up to the IP owner to track, monitor and enforce IP. There are some ways around this, you know, if it is a national 
uh, infringer, someone here in the United States, you can use strategies like cease and desist letters or demand letters as a way to use kind of a scare tactic or a deterrent. Um, and it can also be an opportunity to reach out you always hope it's happening on the front end, but might be an opportunity for a license uh, or an ability, you know, a partnership opportunity um, for a compromise. And I also do encourage our clients. There's there are some kind of scam websites that might do like a PDF of your book, and you try to, you know, go after them. There's it's it's really not worth it. And so, managing a big tip for protecting your IP is kind of understanding what amount of energy you're going to put towards actually the policing and the tracking as well. Great point. All right, this was helpful. Uh, any other attendees want to share their experience or have any questions? Let me check the chat one more time. Go ahead, Hadiza. Did you have something you want to add? Yes. Hey, Adrian, thank you so much <laughs> for all of this wonderful information. Um, <clears throat> I did want to take a moment to share with you all how to access the resource that Adrian mentioned, Legal GPS. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, if you weren't on, um, if you didn't attend part one, um, and you've never heard of this, uh, Legal GPS is a tool to help business, uh, business owners, including authors and illustrators, really understand their choices and their options um, as far as for forming a state law and a tax entity uh, for a business. So it's super informative. And as far as just like taking the time to do your research, this is a tool that like really helps guide that and make sure that you understand what's going on with each step. Um, so I'm going to go ahead right now and just share my screen and show you how to access it. Um, if you've used any of our tools on our digital catalog, you might be familiar with how to navigate our website. If not, um, I don't assume that it's necessarily intuitive. It is what it is. Um, okay, so can everybody see my screen? We're on the Kansas City Public Library homepage. I can. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So you'll be on kclibrary.org. You, you'll see this top navigation bar, and we're going to go all the way to the right-hand side to resources and research, and we'll hover over this for all of the resources to show up in alphabetical order. We are talking about legal GPS. So we're gonna to go to L for legal GPS. And so once we scroll down and find legal GPS in the L part of the list, we'll click on more info. Um, and so at this point, if you have used legal GPS in the past, um, and you haven't used it in the past couple of months, just know that access to legal GPS has changed slightly. Um, legal GPS is now rolled into a larger tool called Wayfarer, which is essentially a tool that uh, helps people on different paths. Um, you are on the legal GPS path of Wayfarer, so uh, I will show you what that looks like once I log in. So when you're on this page, if you're at the library, um, you don't have to worry about having your library card information, but if you're at home or um, not on the library Wi-Fi, you're going to want to make sure that you have that information because you'll be taken to a page uh, that will have you input that information before you even get in to the tool. Um, so if it's your first time, um, just make sure that you read these instructions. The first thing that you're going to do is create an account with Wayfarer, and then you will check your email for the confirmation code um, and enter it into Wayfarer to verify your account. Uh, and then you'll be set to log in. And then that is when you'll go ahead and select the path of legal GPS. So I'll show you what that looks like in a second. I'm going to click on access. And I'm already logged in. So it took me directly to legal GPS. Um, so again, if it's your first time, 
using legal GPS through Wayfarer. This is actually what it's gonna look like when you're on the homepage of Wayfarer. So you'll see these four different paths um, we've got, and th these may apply to anybody that is um, watching this. Um, and this is obviously for authors and illustrators, but you may have other um, needs or know anybody uh, that uh, is interested in any of these paths. So just know that this is here. Uh, path one is for digital resources and research. Uh, path two is for job search and career development. Path three is for um, learning how to use a Chromebook and path four, what we are talking about here, legal GPS. Okay, so that is what that looks like. Uh, I'll go back to legal GPS itself. So this tool, it works as basically a questionnaire with three levels. Um, the first level assumes that you know absolutely nothing about the legal environment of getting a business set up for um, your work as an author or illustrator. Um, and so it's just going to ask you questions uh, that basically get at have you do you already know what kind of entity you want? If so, are you sure you've made the right decision? And within each question are prompts if you're kind of confused about any of the terms. So basically this is a tool that um, is one, diagnosing where you're at as far as your knowledge. Um, and then from there, giving you guidance step-by-step -step on what to do to um, establish your business um, legally. So I will briefly just show you what it looks like. Level one. So these are basic questions. Have you formed a legal entity? I'm just gonna say no. If I don't know what this question is asking, I can click for more information. If I don't know what a legal entity is at all, I can click on this link for more context and, and a definition as well. Um, so for each question, you're going to confirm your answer. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say to this question, are you creating a profit company, LLC, corporation, or sole proprietorship, or a nonprofit organization? Um, and if you were able to attend uh, session one, uh, you'll know that Adrian identified LLC and sole proprietorship as the primary entities that people either default into or form um, as an author or, illust or an illustrator. So these are both for profit companies. So we'll say A, um, do you plan to seek outside cash investment in the next 12 to 18 months? I'm just gonna say no. And your answer may be different when you do this. You're how many owners will your, will your company have? I'm just gonna say one for now. Okay, so now I've come to the end of level one based off of how I answered. If I answered differently, I would have had more questions. So just know that um, depending on how you answer, uh, the questions is gonna really de determine the rest of the questions that you get. Um, Okay, so if you're sure that you answered all of your questions the way that you wanted to, you'll click on calibrate the GPS to move forward. And this is really where um, we will get into how legal GPS or like basically presents the information to you. So after you go through each level's questions, you're gonna basically get to the results pages. So in level one, you're gonna start by really understanding how to use Legal GPS. You'll take the time to read through this section, um, get to know your GPS. Uh, then you'll move on to, should you be a sole proprietorship? This is getting into the actual um, uh, content. Uh, and then once you read through that, you'll go into know your entity choices, then once you understand what the entity choices are, you'll go ahead and decide to choose to be an LLC or a corporation. And then after that, you will go ahead and decide how your company will be taxed. So um, it's very systematic. It's all laid out. 
Um, I will also mention we have we're not going to get into this today because this gets very deep into legal GPS. But when it comes time, you know, you know for sure exactly what kind of entity you want to form um, through the Secretary of State. All of the forms are also embedded within legal GPS, so you don't need to go and find them. Um, and it basically tells you once you get through like le level two's questions, which gets more specific to what kind of entity entities you want to set up after you've completed the level two questions level two's results which will be presented similar to this are really going to show you step by step what you need to do to actually get registered so you'll basically be reading essentially a checklist of what you need to do and in what order um but i i'm not i'm going to stop here because that's kind of getting really deep into it and um Unless this is something you plan on using, I don't want to. I don't want to necessarily dive into that because that wasn't exactly the focus of today's uh, content. Uh, so, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and see if any of you have any questions about Legal GPS, about anything that Adrian presented today, um, or any comments, or you know, lingering thoughts. Adiza, thanks for that overview. I just wanted to ask, is, is Legal GPS, is it a Missouri specific resource? Missouri okay. specific, yes. Okay. Good to know. Thank you for asking that. In case anybody is like based in Kansas. But yeah, it is referencing Missouri. Absolutely, Yasmin. No problem. This is what we like to do at the library is present uh, information in an accessible way uh, to try to reduce the barriers of um, accessing information that's super important. Um, all right. Well, if nobody has any more questions, I will um, shortly wrap this up, but I will let you all know um, as long as you registered, um, and I'm pretty sure that's the only way you would have gotten this Zoom link, but if not, uh, I will, we, we can figure that out later. But um, for everybody who registered, you're gonna get um, a follow-up email once the playback is ready. That will include both parts one and part two, um, the recordings as well as the PowerPoint presentation so that you can follow along on your own time if you'd like. Um, and then I'll also make sure to include my scheduling link in case you wanna have a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, I meet with people who have um, anything from a business idea to something that's already established, whether it's for-profit or non-profit. Um, and I'm very happy to meet with you um, to discuss where you're at um, and to help uh, guide you through the resources that we have available. Oh, okay, question in the chat. Are you guys familiar with Professor Emily Altman? She recommended this event for me from my community college. I don't know. Professor Emily Altman, and that is really awesome. <laughs> that, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know her. Um, Yasmin, where do you go to school? I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.